so when um, I got this mail from Meetup a couple of weeks ago saying that could you come and share some of your personal, uh, a personal journey basically. So I thought to myself, okay now what do I actually talk about myself because unlike uh, the lady who spoke about rebooting, okay, and you ma'am who spoke about uh, Faith in India, right? That's what it was. What a beautiful story. And here I am, I'm actually going to use other people's stories to create a career. That's what I did. Okay, <laughs> fundamentally. So, I'm just going to start with a little... You know, when I go down memory lane, I realize I must have been barely a few months old when I was exposed to the song. You know, one of India's favorites, lullabies if you have to call it, with a very strong subliminal or even maybe an overt message. Mera beta karega naam roshan. Beta being the operative word. And through my formative years, I was met with famous fairy tales in school. And I'm sure all of us did that as well. From friends, mothers, from parents, from grandmothers, and several elders, which primarily comprised of patriarchal undertones. And the examples which really come to mind are of the prince kissing Sleeping Beauty, an absolute stranger, who really actually gave no consent to anybody to kiss her. Or the little princess waiting for a prince to come and rescue her. I mean, we've just been brought up on a diet of that right through. And a striking question emerging from some of the very famous stories which were narrated to me as a child was, why couldn't she get up and run, Mama? I used to ask my mom all the time. And Miss Miss, what happened to the princess's legs? These were either left, ignored, or obviously not entertained. And the little mermaid, if you remember, in Hans Christian Andersen's version, she kills herself at the end because she doesn't really find true love. And I would ask my mom again, Amma, should girls die if your husband die, dies? You know, really these kind of faint questions echo through my life. And as I nag my excessively patient mom with all these questions right through. The princess was so beautiful that everybody loved her. So you have all these beautiful pictures you were put through childhood, which you always saw beautiful. Everywhere you look, looked at even a Hindi film magazine, it's all about how beautiful Hema Malini was, how beautiful Rekha was. That is what fundamentally the focus was on. So, you know, essentially what we were led to believe is that one must always dress up, please people, make yourself a feast for their eyes. Fairy tales that are gendered, lullabies basically that whisper in a very sing song entertaining manner what your role in life is. A woman's value being attached to how very beautiful she is. All perpetuating the myth of antiquated stereotypes. Fairy tales that were supposed to teach us about the moral lessons, you know, on human stories of courage and humility and patience, unfortunately reinforced skewed images about body image and relationships, or even promoting inappropriate ideas about sexual consent. We have let our stories continue lazily through generations. And essentially what we've done by allowing these stories to continue is condition innocent little minds right through. <coughs> I, of course, was... Because essentially what's happening is, because, you know, very often you're told, don't ask these questions, this is how the world has been, we've actually allowed these stories to continue. And we've not really allowed women to take a stand and say that, yes, I'm sorry, these questions need to change, can the stories change and all of that. At home, however, as a daughter of an army officer, you know, it was a more liberal world. I saw all of us sitting at the dinner table together at home. My mother sat at the table, though of course the last to sit. Yes, women do tend to do all the work and sometimes we seem to have three to four jobs. So while at the, on the surface of it, everything seemed completely equal and definitely more equal than the world outside, okay, 
girls and boys you found often sat at opposite ends of the classroom. So when you went to school, you saw that they were sitting on either side. You go to a shop, toys were separated by gender. And truly, from the time you were a kid, the seeds of discrimination are sown. And right through my life, questions, questions, questions. And teachers really had a very, very tough time with me because I started making up my own endings to stories in class. And often, I was actually told to stand in a corner because she doesn't get it. You know, she's always asking questions. And why can't you just follow instructions? These were always, very often, what we all hear. And this whole point of uh, the fact that you're not obedient, that seems to have been one refrain which you heard here right through. Um, thanks to this, what happened was, I started making up my own stories in class. So when I had um, you know, any lessons which had to be you know, uh, uh, studied in school, I would have my own answers to the whole thing. And sometimes what would happen was that, sorry, I seem to have mixed up some stuff here. So like I'm saying that you know my dad was in the army, so we were going around from little you know from Kunu to Amravati Nagar to Imphal to Kalimpong to Bangalore, Goa. So everywhere I went, I found that because I'd started making up stories in school and college. So sometimes when you had the Newton's law of motion and you had three or four laws, I would make up my own. I would have my sixth law of motion. And if there was uh, so gravity being discussed, gravity would actually be for me an apple which would go right up into the sky and probably land up on some planet which I've created on my own. Okay. And essentially then we realized that little stories which I was creating from, as I was going from one city to the other, you know, was actually making me a very popular girl. And so began my life as a little storyteller, actually. And what would I talk about? I would talk about stories which had very funny accents in the South, to how my mom got mobbed by a striking Manipuri group, to living really vicariously through imaginary friends in cities, sometimes which actually never existed. And as I was growing up again, you know, those were the days when you were either an engineer or a doctor. There was no other profession which would really bring a hero to a parent or actually get a dad to twirl his moustache, you know, <laughs> those days. I was terrible at maths and science, but went through the arduous process of actually studying, you know, maths in college. I created my own formulas, which obviously reflected in my grades. My dad was often summoned to college. I would always wonder why my dad was summoned to a girl's college. Okay. And why did they think that my mother would actually talk about the gravity of education and why my daughter was not following the, you know, following instructions, so to say. And one day my father said, look, and that, and I'll show you an example of why I'm telling you this, which was that, you know, who's, you know, you've heard that phrase, a dad can now motion the renew. And why is a dad can now motion the renew? Why doesn't anything else exist? Okay. So my father said that to me one day and I thought to myself, listen, why is that so? Why is it that it's always about, you know, really making a father proud of everything that you did? And he told me, look, all my kids' parents, all my kids, uh, friends' kids, are, all of them are doing so well. You know, why can't they get to my MBA school? So that's okay. For you, I'm going to do this. So what I did was, obviously, I did my CAT exam and I got into IIM Bangalore and it was a very big thing those days to actually get into in the Institute of Management or you either got into IIT or you got into IIM. So I got into IIM and we went to the school and we were standing in the hallowed portals of IIM, the entrance and the, the application forms you filled and the first thing you read is dad's name. Nobody speaks of mom's name. Your passport doesn't talk of it. Wherever it is, it's always about dad's name. And so I told my dad, I'm going to get this little piece of paper for sure, but this is for you, not for me, for sure. So I graduated 18 months later from uh, IIM. I got out, I got my certificate, and I said, Dad, I got this piece of paper for you, but now I'm going to do what I love best, which is writing stories. And that's about it. So like all good Hindi film movie stars, following the trail of having been brought up in a you know, diet of those, I actually went to, and I was, started my career with Ogilvy Bangalore. I said no to all the premium, fabulous banks, city bank, to everybody else who had offered me a job. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to create a career out of just writing stories, nothing else. And so I stood on Marine Drive and almost copying, say, somebody like Shah Rukh Khan, saying, look at Mumbai skyline and saying that I'm going to write my own destiny. I tore up my certificates and I hope no young student is listening to this because I really wouldn't want you to do this. I picked up my certificate, tore them, threw them to the Arabian Sea and I said here from now I'm going to start from ground zero. And that's what essentially what happened. So I joined an advertising agency 
I worked my way through various advertising agencies, starting from Ogilvy to Leo Burnett to Rediffusion, where I actually left as Chief Creative Officer. And um, I said, decided to start my own company called Soul Grand Solutions. And like an emotional fool, I never looked at, and lots of women are not very detail oriented as far as legal is concerned, so I never looked at any of that. And I discovered, I said, oh my God, I thought I was a partner, but I wasn't an equal partner. That was one of the big decisions I made in my life to quit that company, and I said no. So I joined um, House of Anita Dongre as Chief Creative Officer, which is what I was at Rediffusion as well, and worked with her a couple of years, and then I said, okay, I have to come back into the world of storytelling, and therefore I joined Star. But what I really loved about advertising was that it really allowed you to lend emotion and you try, try to tell stories, short stories, 60 seconds, 30 seconds, 10 seconds, but it really allowed you to, to really, what would I say, a fertile imagination which grew over my, you know, my dad's various postings, so to say. So lending emotion to inanimate objects like soap and tea and oil and you know, beer and uh, uh, what shall I call it, uh, uh, cricket clubs, to so everything that you could think of. And my head really became a spinning factory for ideas. And my love has become my career and therefore stories right through. And um, what I really love about advertising, and I must say this, and this is all about women up, that I never saw inequality there. So every time I read stories about in the press and hear horrific stories, you know, about uh, women who there's a pay issue to everything else, and I keep wondering, I've been one of those blessed people I've never had to actually be a victim of inequality in the workplace or at home, for that matter. You know, but there are some very important observations I must say about uh, being a woman leader. In the workplace that until the day we believe we are equal we will never ever be equal so we have to believe that we are equal there's no question of reclaiming it just assume the space is yours you know and i've had the good fortune of attending a couple of um, talks by some other women across and i realized that unless you believe that you are equal there is no question of you being equal if you are a victim you will be treated like a victim as simple as that so and Though I must say a couple of things, at work as a non-smoker, I've really had colleagues who have finished very important conversations in the smoking corridor. And you realize, I don't smoke now. Do I, do I need to smoke to be part of the team? No, I'm not going to do that. Why should I really change my life? Because other people expected me to. So when they came back from uh, the corridor conversation, so to the into the conference room, I had to ask this very important question. Hey, what did you discuss? Okay, and I know that the conversation would have moved forward, conclusions may have been drawn, and I'm talking about the time when I was growing up, right? So your middle management, not today, where you can actually say, okay, fine, this is, I'm the one who's setting the agenda. So there are other people who are setting the agenda, CEOs are setting the agenda. You know, so they come back in, stand your ground, and say, hey, may I hear exactly what happened? So if there is any progress, or we will start from where we started from, and continue the conversation in the workplace. Um, there have been some other occasions where I was working on uh, Nano, I remember the launch of Nano and uh, there was a very uh, uh, a big business leader who actually said, you know, you're a woman, you may not understand how cars are marketed. You know, you really need to, want, I don't think we'll get the mechanics of it. And I had to remind them that, hey, listen, the audience doesn't really know who's the author of this communication, whether it's a man or woman. You know, but this is such a small point on inequality. It wasn't really about whether, it was more a function of whether I really understood you know, uh, cars or I didn't. But there, there, there are conversations which you tend to hear in the workplace very often. And one of the big things is that sometimes people ask you, you know, or, or make you believe that you're too ambitious for your job, you know, so you've got to stand your ground and be assertive. Aggression is very often seen as being overly aggressive and both men and women in the same place, if they were to ask the questions in the same assertive tone, a woman might be considered a little bit aggressive. And I've noticed that occasionally when I've been to a client meeting or something like that. So I think the point is just to stand up and own your success. And as long as you think that the space is yours, there's no question of having to reclaim it. Really, you're the author of your own life. And that sounds like a preachy statement to make, but I have been privileged to see quite a few of my colleagues who've done really well in the workplace because of that. And because typically we women tend to be a little apologetic, you know, in having to, like the earlier thing about actually negotiating your own uh, salaries, etc., etc. But I think the point is to not to think yourself as a man or a woman, just as a professional, and I think you will get your due. At least that's been my experience as well. 
But the big question that haunts all of us, uh, I'm sure it uh, comes to you as well, who had really invented the glass ceiling firstly? And if we don't recognize the ceiling, surely it can't exist. And we can really march forward or upwards, whichever way looking at it. Over my own personal journey, I have tried to plant a few thoughts through some stories which uh, I've had the uh, good fortune to write. Um, basically, why can't a business legacy be taken forward by a woman? Uh, the importance of raising our boys right, you know, very often because, I mean, I have a boy and I think sometimes I discriminate against him by making sure my daughter's sleep a little bit more. That may not really be the best thing to have done, but yes, I think raising your children right is very, very important. Raising your boys right is even more important, you know, and they are the ones who are going to go out and ensure, you know, that they see women, as long as they, are, they grow up believing that brothers and sisters, there is no real difference in terms of what they get and the privileges that they get, I don't think there can be any. Um, I mean, it really would help, I guess, in the long run, I would say. And absolutely, there are no lines to cross. I mean, every line is there for a woman to be crossed, and every boundary is there for yours, for you, just as it is for a man. So, I'm just going to play you a couple of films through some of the insights. So. <laughs> क्या बात है गुरुदीप पाजी है बड़े जोश मोश से बिक रही है आपकी मिठाइया है <laughs> तो सब बच्चों की मेहनत है जी <laughs> वो इंटरनेट नहीं होता इंटरनेट हाँ 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 उस पर डाल दिया बिजनेस को बस बड़े होनार हो गए आपके बेटे बेटे नहीं जी बेटिया गुरदीप सिंह एंड डॉटर्स चंगा है कामयाबी ना लड़का देखती है ना लड़की कामयाबी से सोच देखती है स्टाउस नहीं सोच Stop loss. Nice, Ochi. 